Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson Edexcel International A-Level, Chemistry Unit 1 for June 2022. I will do this paper in three videos and this is the part one. I will put the links to the other parts in the description box below this video. So let's begin. Question one says elements in their most stable state exist as so here we can see elements will exist as uh, isolated atoms that is possible example like sodium elements can exist as atoms in molecules you can see that and elements can exist as giant structures like you know carbon exists as graphite or as diamond so the answer here should be a d i know here they said atoms in giant structures only that is wrong atoms in molecules and atoms in giant structures only no they're atoms that are independent or isolated and then isolated atoms and atoms in giant structures only no it exists as all these the example we have i have put here sodium chlorine or oxygen and then carbon in diamond and graphite so that is d question two says a sample of nitrogen gas contains that molecules they ask what is the mass of this sample if we are looking for the mass of this sample and we're given the number of molecules i need to use this number of molecules to find the number of moles of nitrogen in that sample so the first part was to say the number of molecules given should be one because each nitrogen has n2 it's just n2 times the number of moles which we are looking for times avogadro's number and then if i make the number of moles the subject i will get that divided by avogadro's number which gives me the number of moles as 0 0.02 mole now since i know this is nitrogen and i know each nitrogen atom is 14 so the molecule is going to be for 28 I will say mass should equal to number of moles times the molar mass, which is 0 0.02 times 28. So in this case, we get 0 0.56 grams, and therefore the answer should be a C for that. So moving on to question three. Question three says, when magnesium oxide reacts with dilute sulfuric acid, the equation is as below. What is the ionic equation for this reaction? To get an ionic equation, we need to split those that are aqueous. So I did it down here. You can see magnesium is a solid. You leave it independently. However, the sulfuric acid can be split into 2H plus and SO4, 2 minus. On the other side, magnesium sulfate is an aqueous, so we can also split it into Mg2 plus and SO4, 2 minus. And the water is a liquid, so we do not split it. Then afterwards, we cancel out things that are similar on opposite sides like that cancels out with that and whatever remains that is your ionic equation so here the ionic equation should be mgo solid plus 2h plus uh, aqueous giving us mg2 plus aqueous plus water liquid therefore b is the perfect answer question 4 says a solution of sodium chloride uh, is prepared by dissolving 10 grams of the solid in distilled water and making a solution up to 250 centimeters cube then they ask what is the concentration of the solution in mole per decimeter cube? If you're looking for concentration in mole per decimeter cube, when you have the volume in centimeters cubed, we need to first convert that volume to decimeters cubed and then find the number of moles. So to find the number of moles, since we're given the mass and we know it's sodium chloride, we can find the number of moles by saying mass divided by the molar mass, which is 10 divided by 58.5. The molar mass of sodium chloride is 58.5 as we're given here. So the answer comes out as 0 0.17094 mole. And then, since we know how many moles are in the 250 centimeters cube, we can be able to find how many moles are in one decimeter cube. So to convert uh, 250 into decimeters cube, we have to divide it by 1000. And then to find the concentration, it should be the number of moles divided by the volume, which gives us this. When we round it off, it is 0 0.684 mole per decimeter cubed, and the perfect answer here is a B. Let's move on to question 5. Question 5 says 10 test tubes, each containing 1 centimeter cubed of chromium chloride solution uh, of concentration 0 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed, were placed in a test tube, a rack, different volumes of silver nitrate solution of concentration 0 0.1 mole uh, were added. 0.1 mole per decimeter cube were added to each test tube, giving a precipitate of silver chloride. Now, if you know, this means actually they put out several test tubes containing chromium-3 chloride, 
And they in, to each test tube, they're adding an increased amount of volume of silver nitrate to see how much silver nitrate is required to completely finish all the chr chromium chloride that was placed. And again, remember, each test tube is going to have the same amount, same volume, of course, the same concentration. So it's going to have the same of the chromium chloride. And then periodically, they're going to increase the volume. Maybe if they put one centimeters cubed here, they'll put two centimeters cubed here, they'll put three centimeters cubed and four centimeters cubed successively in each test tube until we see there is no more change in the uh, height of the precipitate that is going to be generated. So let's go down here. You can see here at about 3.05, this point here, 3.05 here, we can see that uh, uh, there was no more uh, increment in the height of the precipitate, however much you add, you increase the volume of silver nitrate. So down here they say, what is the formula of the chromium chloride? So to find the formula of the chromium, chromium chloride, I tried to demonstrate something like this here. Remember in the test tube, we have chromium chloride, but we do not know uh, if it's chromium-3 or chromium-2 or whichever. So I put that this BX, the, the power, the, the charge on chromium, let it be X. So this creates CR, CLX. And here for silver nitrate, we were, given the, we were given the concentration and I found the volume about 3.05. So when I use this, I can find the number of moles of silver nitrate that was added in order for, the, for all the chromium chloride to be completed. Because if the precipitate is not changing anymore, it means all the chromium chloride has been used up. So the amount or the, the number of moles of silver nitrate required for this was 3.05 times 10 power negative 4 mole. And then on this side, I wanted to find the number of moles of chromium chloride. Since I know the volume and I know the concentration, I calculated the number of moles to be 1 times 10 power 4. Now we know that if the moles of silver nitrate required were 3.05 times 10 power 4, yet the moles of chromium, CLX present, were that. To have a one-to-one -one ratio of silver and, chlor and uh, chromium chloride, it should have been three times of this. So the chloride from here should be three times in order to use up one of that. So here I say, and again, I want to show you clearly, if each silver reacts with one chloride it, from the silver nitrate as well, chromium chloride, it means we need it three times. So it means the value of X should be a three and therefore this is gonna be CRCL three. So the answer here should be a D. Let's go on to question six. Question six, the atomic number of the element scandium is 21 and the mass number of its only isotope is 45. What is the number of electrons in a scandium ion? Scandium plus one. Remember here, they've told us the atomic number is 21, and we know if an element uh, has 21 as the atomic number, it also has 21 electrons. So if that element is converted into an ion of plus one charge, it means it should have lost one electron. Therefore, this should have uh, 20 electrons because 21 minus one gives you 20. Therefore, 20 electrons are present in scandium plus one. The answer is A. Question B says, in a mass spectrometer, scandium forms scandium plus one and scandium plus two ions. What is the mass to charge value for the mass spectrum peak due to scandium two plus? Here we have to know because it's mass divided by charge, it has to be 45 divided by two, which is 22.5. And therefore the answer for that should be an A as well. Question seven says, which, which equation represents the first ionization energy of iodine? First, ionization energy is when one mole of gaseous atom is converted into one mole of gaseous ion. So in this case, it means the reactant should be a gas. So this is wrong, and that is, this is wrong. This is wrong, and that is wrong. However, it should also be one mole. In this case here, this is twice. So the only correct answer should be one because remember you're producing one mole of gaseous ions. Here they produce two moles, so that is also wrong. So the only correct answer is this, because for this, one mole of gaseous ions is produced from one mole of gaseous atoms. So the answer should be a D here. For question A, they say, what is the electronic configuration of nitrogen atom? And again, remember nitrogen atom has seven electrons. However, when you do the electronic configuration, even if we have seven here 
and 7 there, electrons have to be arranged in a way that allows the pairing. However, they have to be, they cannot be facing the same side within the same orbital. So this is wrong, that is wrong. And uh, let me see here, this one here is also not right because this one facing down. The only correct one is a C because it is following the rules. This one cannot face down before pairing begins to occur, so that is wrong. The answer here should be a C. Question 9 says the element manganese has the atomic number Z is equal to 25. What is the number of sp and d electrons in an atom of manganese? If atomic number is 25, it means when you follow the configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and then 4s2, and then 3d5. So in this case, I saw that S are going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8 electrons in the S, as we can see here. And then we have 12 electrons in the P. And finally, we have 5 electrons in the D, and therefore the answer here should be a P for question 9. Let's move on to question 10. It says, which row of the table shows the correct forces in a crystalline of lithium, a crystal of lithium iodide? Remember, lithium iodide is an ionic compound, so it means the attractive forces between ions with opposite charges exist. That is correct. Repulsive forces between ions of like charges, yes, they exist, so you cannot find a lithium ion closer to lithium ion because they will repel each other, and when they repel each other, the crystal will break apart. So since this is already a crystal, it means similar charged ions are going to be far away from each other as possible. So that means this is also correct. And then lastly, some covalent bonding forces. There is some covalent bonding because when you see lithium is a very small ion and iodine is a very small, big ion. So there is going to be some polarization that occurs here. And therefore, that creates some covalent nature due to polarization. Therefore, the answer should be a D. There is some covalency that takes place in here. Question 11, some physical properties of five substances are shown. The letters are not element, element symbols. So we have L, M, N, P, Q. So they ask, which of these substances could be metals? One thing we know about metals is that they do conduct electricity, whether in solid state or in liquid state. So if you're looking for metal, this one is not a metal, that is not a metal, and that is not a metal because metals do conduct electricity in solid state and they do in liquid state. Now, some metals can be soluble while others will be insoluble in water. So this to still fit the rule. And then some metals can have lower melting points while others can have a higher melting point. The example is mercury, mercury as a metal which is liquid at room temperature. I'm not saying this is the melting point, but at room temperature, mercury is a liquid. So it tells you some metals can have lower enough melting points, which brings us to the answer as a C because it's only that and that that are suitable to be metals. The next part says which substance has properties showing that it changes from a molecular structure to ions when it dissolves in water. Now, if something uh, dissolves in water, it means it's a simple molecule, and therefore we know it cannot be, uh, so it should not conduct electricity, it should not be a solid, it, sh it should not be a solid. So uh, if it's a solid, it's possible that it can be a solid, maybe like an example, it's frozen or something like that, but it should not be able to conduct electricity in solid state. So here we can see poor conductor that and that and that can fit in solid state. And then when we go to liquid state, they should not be able to conduct electricity as well. So that and that. And then finally, we have here when it's in dissolved in water, this one should be able to dissolve in water. So the only thing that fits all the three is going to be a Q, as you can see here. And the answer is going to be a D. And again, to emphasize, they say it, which substance has properties showing that it changes from molecular structure to ions when it dissolves in water. It, that is when it does it, from molecular structure when it dissolves in water. So there is going to be poor conductivity when it's a liquid as well. And the good conductivity will be seen when it's dissolved in water. So we can see that. So because it only dissolves in water to form the ions, the ions are only formed when it's dissolved in water. So... Yep, that should be it. Next says, at 180 degrees Celsius, aluminium chloride exists as aluminium chloride, uh, exists as that. This is a dimerized version. They ask, what is the structure of this? Now we know this is wrong, and you know this is wrong, so the, the, the struggle is between these two. 
Now, one thing we can see is for here, we can see the lone pair is coming from chlorine to uh, aluminium, which makes sense. For this one, it's coming from aluminium to chlorine, which doesn't make sense because aluminium doesn't have any lone pair. So this is out, and therefore the only answer we can see is a C, which is the answer to question 12. Moving on to question 13, it says, when carrying out chemical experiments, the hazards and risks must be considered for a given chemical. So they ask for a given chemical, the hazard is fixed, but the risk varies. This is correct. Any chemical, let me take an example, sulfuric acid is always going to be, uh, is always going to be, of course, dangerous to the skin. It can burn you. It's going to have that hazard no matter what. Let's take another example. Fuel is always going to be flammable. Whether you bring it closer to fire or not, it has that potential to cause harm. And that is what we call the hazard. However, the risk is when the harm actually happens. So if I get a fuel and I bring it closer to the fire, I'm increasing the risk. However, if I keep it away from the fire, the risk is being minimized. So there is a possibility to vary the risk, but the hazard will always be there. It's always going to be flammable no matter what you do. So the answer for this should be an A. Question 14 says, hydrolytic fusion produces... Easy. Heterolytic fusion, it means things are breaking separately or they are not sharing electrons. Let's so take an example of this. When this breaks heterolytically, uh, the most electronegative one takes both electrons and the product is going to be ions. Uh, clo uh, in this case, uh, H plus as well as Cl minus. One is going to be positively charged and the other is going to be negatively charged. So ions only are going to be produced. And here we can see the answer is going to be a B. So moving on to the next question, question 15. So here they say, a hydrocarbon X has a molar mass of 98 gram per mole. When a sample of X is shaken with bromine water, the color of the bromine water does not change. So because it does not change, it means the hydrocarbon does not have a carbon-carbon double bond. Therefore, this is out. So they're going to say, which uh, of these could be the structure? Now here you had to find out the molar mass and I calculated and I realized it's only this one that had the potential molar mass we're looking for, which is a 98 gram per mole. And therefore the answer for this should be a D. The others will not have the same molar mass. And again, you have to remember this one, 98 gram per mole is only going to be for a cyclo, something that has a cyclo structure. This is straight chain, that is straight chain, this is straight chain. The difference is this one here has a carbon carbon double bond which uh, breaks it away from here. And again, remember, cyclo compounds as well as alkenes, if they have the same number of carbons, they can have the same uh, general formula. So it means this would be confused with that, but this one here tells them apart. So the answer should be here for D. Moving on to question 16, it says, which of these atmospheric pollutants is not emitted during the combustion of alkane car fuels? When alkenka fuels are burnt, we can produce oxides of nitrogen, we can produce oxides of sulfur, and of course, alkanes can be produced. So the only thing that is not produced is ammonia, and therefore this is easy to tell. The answer is an A. For question 17, they say, which of these occurs in a propagation step of a reaction of methane and chlorine? In propagation, it means one free radical reacts with an unfree radical to produce another free radical. So let's see, this one here is not propagation because two free radicals are reacting, this is termination. And this one here, it cannot occur this way because then this is reacting with that, that is wrong. Uh, let me see, for this one, this kind of reaction cannot occur. The only possible answer is here. So the answer for question 17 is going to be a B. In this case, this radical is going to react with chlorine to form chloromethane, and this is going to be converted into another free radical. So let's continue to question 18. Question 18 says, what is the IUPAC name of the compound with the structure we see here? Now, when you look at this, you can see this is an alkene, easy. And we can see that it has one, two, three, four carbons, so it should be a butene. Also, we can see that the carbon-carbon double bond is on carbon two, so it's a but to in. And then we can see there is a chloro on carbon two, so it's two chloro but to in. And then we have to determine, is it an E or a Z isomer? Since on this carbon, the higher priority group is on this side, and on this carbon, the higher priority group is on the other side, this is going to be an E isomer, and therefore the answer is E dash 2 dash chlorobutuin, which is a C here. 
So this brings us to the end of this video, which is the end of section A of this paper. Uh, thank you for being with us. And please do not forget to subscribe to our channel. I will put the links to the other videos in the description box below. Uh, so see you next time. Bye-bye.